Hello, everybody. Yeah, welcome to our CPNP seminar. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome Stefan Kiebel uh, today, tonight uh, here. Um, so, as uh, just said, um, I'm, I'm going to say a few words about uh, his CV. Um, Stefan actually uh, studied uh, computer science or informatics. I don't know. Sometimes uh, in your CV, you're saying computer science, sometimes informatics, doesn't matter. Something about like uh, computers uh, in Dortmund. And um, then actually also worked there a bit at the um, neurology department, like in Essen, uh, so close to um, Dortmund. And from there, he uh, joined uh, uh, the neurology department in Jena for, for a short time, as, as we just learned. And then actually moved on to work with uh, Carl Frissen at the Phil laboratory and was is one of the main developers and there are only few out there for SPM over about like 10 years or so so like the still leading software for the analysis of fMRI but not only fMRI as we also use now for like EG um, analysis uh, the software and uh, developed there uh, many parts you know, for like uh, pre-processing of the fMRI uh, data, but more or less wrote the whole EG part by himself, yeah, and uh, published an uh, enormous amount of um, papers, which are which are really highly uh, cited. So it's one of the, let's say, leading world leading people like in methods in uh, um, neuroimaging. After uh, his time in London, he. Um, found his own uh, research group in Leipzig at the MPI there, um, stayed there for a couple of years and then got a professorship in Jena, um, became also the head of the MEG um, group uh, there and then moved on another professorship um, at the Technical University in Dresden where it's um, um, our group and moved also in terms of like um, scientific interest more from the methods part to now computational cognitive new science and has now also uh, done wonderful work as he will show us uh, uh, today. So it's uh, very nice having you here and I'm very much looking forward uh, to your talk, Stefan. Yeah, thanks Felix. Um, for the introduction. Okay, can you guys see the slides? I guess, yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's a really pleasure for me to talk um, at your seminar. And uh, so the title is Context Inference as a Basis for Fast and Flexible Action Selection. I will try to explain during my talk what I mean by this, actually. And uh, before, uh, I just want to show pretty pictures about Dresden. It's really pretty, uh, Dresden. Um, so this is the center, and this is uh, where we live. Everything is really green. There's a river, very nice, a blue bridge. And we also, uh, science-wise, we are contributing to three big initiatives, an excellence cluster, uh, and then TRR about a substance use disorder, and an SFB about um, cognitive control. And many of the things I'm um, presenting today came really out of um, this SFB here. So this is my uh, group and especially these four people here. I'm talking about their work where the first authors, um, Zara and uh, Florian, especially contributed mostly um, uh, mostly to, um, to that work. So let's talk first a bit about habits and goal-directed control, what, and just a flavor of what uh, we're talking about. So habits, uh, many people know, in German you would say Gewohnheiten, and habits is really something you um, learn quickly, you keep up, you do it at a regular pace, and habits are difficult to unlearn. Uh, for example, if you're a regular runner, this is maybe a habit, if you if you um, going the stairs and not the elevator, it's a habit. Maybe playing every night computer games is certainly a habit. Um, passing this pub and always drinking a beer uh, on your way from work would also be a habit. And the big question in people's lives is really, okay, um, habits, they're really difficult. In any, um, any bookshop, you would have at least two meters of self-help books about habits. 
where the idea is that you lose bad habits, so-called bad habits, and you try to keep the good habits. So what everyone knows is that habits are really difficult to unlearn. Um, and the trick seems to be to keep the good habits, but try to unlearn the others, which is difficult. And I think that's why there's so many books about this. So the other extreme really is goal-directed control, where this is mostly about when we plan forward or we plan through things. We, um, For example, when we work, there might be lots of um, examples where we do um, goal-directed control or when you plan your time in the future is controlled, then any board game might be goal-directed control. And of course, if you're, for example, in a new environment and you want to find your way from A to B, you do something like all directed control. And clearly in psychology, cognitive neuroscience, and maybe also in our subjective experience, there's a distinction, a dichotomy even between different modes of behavioral control. One you could call habitual control and the other one goal directed control. And about this topic, there's of course a lot of reviews and one of the good ones is here, Wood and Ringert from 2016. And the attributes you usually read when you um, hear about habitual control is that there's some automatic behavior, it's somehow related to this. They are fast um, because they're computationally cheap, so they're easy to compute. They're unfortunately quite rigid. That means, as I said, they're difficult to unlearn and you keep doing the same thing. And uh, what is very important in the in my presentation is they are context specific. So that means that you, if in a specific place or time or situation, you keep doing the same um, habit, like for example, in the bathroom in the morning, there's a toothbrush in front of you. Maybe you start your habit of brushing the teeth in that context. And then on the other hand, there's goal-directed control and that's attributed with being deliberate, slow, because it's computationally, as one knows, very expensive. And this is distinct from habitual control, they're adaptive. Uh, control is adaptive. That means you can react to sudden changes of the environment, unexpected changes even, and try to um, adapt um, your behavior. So the question really that we are aiming at in the long term is, okay, is, is that the thing we're using for real life actions? And many, maybe most of our daily actions are neither habitual nor fully goal-directed, but they're rather somewhere uh, on this line in the middle or more right or left here. And for example, if you wake up in the morning and you go through your day and you think about what you're going to do, it's certainly a mixture because you, you tend to do the same thing you have done yesterday. <laughs> so you go to work, work, have lunch, do more work, go home. Um, but there's of course also things that are novel, so you try to build them into your plan. Also navigating through traffic, it would be a catastrophe if you're only habit-based in traffic, because you would not react, adapt to certain changes in the environment. Um, so you need a mixture of these two controllers and also social interactions. You keep doing the same thing with your friends, but if you want to be witty in your remarks, you need to have some goal-directed control. So most of our actions are really somewhere in the middle. And in cognitive neuroscience and psychology, um, I think the mainstream view is really um, that there are somehow two systems, two controllers maybe, and this is a dichotomy. And the thing is, if it's a dichotomy, if there are two controllers, two systems, then the question automatically becomes immediately, okay, how do we combine, link up these controllers to um, do actions that are a mixture between these two things, these two extremes. So what is what is the formula for mixing these two controllers? That's a question if you assume a dichotomy two systems. So let me first give a brief introduction of what we have as models uh, for habits and goal-directed control and how to mix them. So first habit learning um, is very well known and there's lots of theories, frameworks, and um, models even. Initially, when you learn habits, you come to a new situation, and one knows that your actions are based on expected rewards. So you're very sensitive to reward. Uh, you're also very flexible to changes in the environment. So you're really using goal-directed control here, and it's slow and costly 
the planning is costly. And then gradually, when you go to the situation again and again, you repeat your actions, you become more habitual. So your behavior is based on past behavior. So you tend to repeat things and your experience. You become more inflexible to changes. And on the good side, you're fast and resource efficient. So that's the trajectory one assumes uh, people are taking when they're doing habit learning. And there's an estimate by McCloskey and Johnson 2019 paper that says roughly 45% of people's behavior might qualify as habitual. So it's taking up a lot of our actions. By qualify as habitual, I mean mostly habitual or close to habitual. What we know, what is good for learning habits is the frequency. So you want to repeat a lot of times the actions, then there should be rewards in the beginning. So you start learning habits. And very importantly, the context in which you do your actions, which become or qualify later as habits, the context should be stable. That means whatever you do in the context and you do the same thing, the outcome is the same. So when we look then at goal-directed actions, there's a thing called forward planning, which is computationally very expensive, but very important for goal-directed action and forward planning. It's a thing that, for example, chess computers use when they think about how to win the game. So it's very goal-directed, you want to win the game, and you can build decision trees where you do a move and then you have certain opponents' reactions, and based on these reactions, you do other moves and the whole tree becomes really large immediately because there's so many things the opponents can do. But basically, if you're an agent that wants to select an action, which is goal-directed, you somehow have to um, go at least partially through this decision tree to find out um, to how you can maximize the probability that you will be in a winning state later on. And for example, there's also AlphaGo, which is the same thing just for Go, which was more difficult. And board games currently, I think, are considered solved um, because computers or agents are currently better than the best human players on the planet. And one important thing for board games is they, are, they make discrete moves. So you have states uh, where you have to transition between discrete states. Then the rules are deterministic, so you're not allowed to violate rules. Uh, the state is known because you can observe all the board and you have quite a short planning horizon because it's a board game, so it will be over at some point and then finished. If you compare this to our environment, we have a continuous environment that is not discrete. The rules, unfortunately, are probabilistic, so there are people who don't um, keep to the rules. They do stuff if you don't expect. Um, the state cannot be observed. Usually it's inferred. It's, it's sometimes even unknown what state you're in. And you have a very long planning horizon because, for example, the game doesn't end in an hour, but it ends with your life. So, for example, if you think about social relationships, these are long-term things. What I want to say with this slide is that uh, photo planning is really the, the, the basis for goal-directed actions and it's computationally very expensive, especially in our environment. And the question is then, how can you mix the assumed habitual controller with a goal-directed controller? And there's, of course, uh, a lot of models, and I do a very brief selective review of some. Um, most of you know maybe the idea that you can have a model-free and model-based reinforcement learning controller and mix them to come up with the action control in the middle. And Adore, for example, um, proposed this in this very famous 2005 paper. And the idea of mixing is really that the agent is in a situation and then the agent has a controller which doesn't say a now goal-directed control but is doing planning. And there's another controller which we might call model-free, habitual, it doesn't really matter at this course grade level. But basically there are two controllers and they're running in parallel. So there's something coming in, they don't both compute what they would do. And then there's an arbitration step, which takes the input from these two controllers and does some mixing. And then this arbitration step puts out um, the action. That's roughly um, the idea. And you have uh, var variants of this, for example, Lee et al. 2014 and Miller et al. 2019, uh, where he um, described so-called habits without values, 
uh, but based uh, so it's basically proposing repetition learning I will come back later this, to this idea and these mixing models have the limitation that they don't really explain how habitual control can be computationally inexpensive so these controllers they because they run these two controllers in parallel to then afterwards mix them they have to have the planning in there they need the output of the planning of the goal directed control in other words you're losing again the advantage of habitual control fast speed uh, because you have to run the planning um, or model based or goal directed control as you like to call it so that's a big advantage a disadvantage of these models then there's another breed of models uh, I would call two systems the switching arbitration and examples are for example two papers by Karamati and Pesulu and the idea here is that you start out with habits and then the arbitration really tries to find out using for example a kind of cost benefit analysis or like is it useful to use planning or goal directed control to then only if that is found out that this should be used only then planning is used so it's like it tries to use habits if it's not enough it puts in some planning and that would definitely solve the um, the computational um, um, speed because ideally you only run the habits and the arbitration and decides you don't need the planning and then you go with your action you can do a habit which is very fast but the limitation here is really that these controllers are really what they do is that they um, either use control or planning or habits but there is no mixing it's they mix in that they for example do a little bit of habit then they do goal directed control then they switch back to habit and so on and this switching um, is very clever but really you can't come up with actions that are a little bit of both um, based on planning and habits so how can you do it differently and this is really the idea I want to propose today before I do that we use active inference and I just one slide for maybe those people among you who have never heard about active inference um, so there's Carl Fristen who really described active inference in a lot of papers uh, I cite here one of them um, which is very readable and um, it's described as a Bayesian computation framework which explains how organisms perceive act and learn so the whole story and there's a free energy principle uh, and then in a nutshell really what it says is organisms minimize the surprise about sensory input that's really what they do and organisms represent implicitly the environment by a generative model and very importantly as I said perception learning and action is explained as probabilistic inference in machine learning there's also uh, people trying that it's called planning by inference for example that they say okay this is how you can do action by inference but for cognitive neuroscience psychology and neuroscience really what it means is that there is no motor control is 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 inference so it should be called motor inference maybe and what we're picking up here and why we're using active inference is to take this element and really use it to make a balanced um, controller that does um, solve a couple of problems okay what is the key idea is we definitely have um, something like um, two extremes of control I mean there we know them by subjective experience or they can be measured in a lab but not it doesn't mean that because there are two extremes of course it doesn't mean that you need two systems or two controllers you could also go with single controller and say okay this thing because we humans we're made for these daily routine actions which are neither really habitual neither goal directed somewhere in the middle this is where we mostly work uh, where what we do as actions and then there are two extremes which we call habitual actions and goal directed actions which are really just the extremes of this single controller and the assumption here is how this works is that the single controller in our view could for example infer how much planning should be used so for example if this controller says just use the habit whatever it is and don't use planning then we would be looking very habitual and if the single controller says okay we don't know anything about the situation here we don't have a habit use a lot of planning then we go into this other extreme here and the idea is really if you have no planning you have habitual actions like I said and the medium planning the most interesting thing in the middle is mixed actions where 
maybe most of our daily actions are anyway. So the question is, of course, how, how would you implement this, this idea? And this is described in this paper where, where I said that is really the, I mean, first author and did the equations. Um, and I'm trying to, because it's quite a dense paper, lots of equations, <laughs> trying to give you the overview to say what the basic idea behind it is. So just to reiterate the existing computation models, what they use as key properties uh, for habit models is really what they describe well as insensitivity to changes. So after a lot of repetition of an action, you become insensitive to change, for example, change a reward. What's also well modeled is the dependency on training duration. So the more we learn, the more habitual we become, which makes sense. What hasn't been modeled so uh, well, as I said, is that habits are resource efficient, that they can be done really quickly, fast. And the fourth thing, strangely, is context sensitivity. And this is really one hallmark of habits, that they're context sensitive. For example, if you want to unlearn a an habit, the best thing ever to do this is to change context, to move to a new city, to start a new life, to just change your environment so that your habit doesn't kick in. So because you're in a different context. And these two things haven't been hallmarks of recent models. And that's what we want to add here. So the idea really is to take this context sensitivity very seriously and use this as the central modeling device around every around which everything else is ordered. So that's the idea. So on the left, we have the say traditional classical view of mixing. And this is um, the idea I'm now describing. It's a context specific um, action inference. And I describe on the next slide what I mean by context actually. But let's say there is a context, a situation, and you're in a specific state. And then you start planning. And the key idea is that in that context, we have learned by previous exposures to that same context, we have learned so-called prior over actions. That's nothing else than a counter. How many times with what frequency have you chosen action one versus two or three? So for example, it could be that the prior says 80% of the time in that context, I've used um, action one. And that's the prior. And if the prior is very high, it would make sense for the agent to say, look, in 99% of previous exposures to that situation here, to that context, I have used this one action. Should I really go into a lot of planning or should I just go a little bit planning and then say, oh, come on, this is okay. I have been doing this before. It was always fine. I didn't die. Let's do it again. So that's the idea. The strength of this prior really um, guides how much planning should be involved. And this is available, uh, planning is available, and this can be done in an agent. So what is the context? Um, there's unfortunately a lot of definitions and meanings of context, especially in psychology, but also in um, our daily language. And what we mean here by context is rather mathematical. We talk about a hierarchical genitive model, and the context is then one of the top level states, which describes in what situation are we? It's really like a categorization of a situation. So each situation is unique or novel, but we assume the brain um, categorizes each situation into a more general context. Says, okay, that's context number 41A. You're in, you have been there before, um, that's where you're in. And context inference then means that you get your brain gets your input extraceptive and interceptive and then given the input and other variables maybe uh, like what you have been doing before you can then infer quickly rapidly your current context what situation am i in and that actually gives you access to memory for example to this prior i talked about so how often did i use specific action sequence in that context before actually you could also say what are my goals in this context typically and you could load state action transition matrices. So it's like you load your, maybe another word is task set, you load what you know about this specific task. And then the idea is really, really simple. Um, if you make a decision, you have basically in this picture two sources of information. And one is the past. You have learned in this context 
whatever the frequency of your actions before. So you can use it as a prior of action to say, I've done action one 80% of the time, the other is such and such percentages. And then you have the future. You can really say in this situation, you can plan forward and say, okay, given this very specific situation, what should I do? What gives me my desired outcome? This is your planning. And what you can then do, you have two sources of information. The best thing I know uh, for combining these two sources of information is Bayesian inference. So what you can do is just to write down this little formula saying, okay, you have a prior of actions, which gives you just an a priori tendency of repeating actions you have been doing in this context before. And then you have a likelihood, which is just another word for planning that you say, okay, given if I did action one, uh, what is the probability that I will get to a rewarding state or get some reward on the next trial, for example. And this is really planning, computing the expected reward. And then we just, this is a multiplication sign, multiply this to give you a prior, a posterior, sorry, posterior over actions. And then you could, for example, just select the maximum uh, posterior action and that would be your action, action selection. So what we're proposing is that you just reframe this slightly um, and then you get Bayesian inference and we can use active inference for implementing this. So just to give you an idea how this works. So let's look at someone learning a habit um, and you start out with a novel task, novel context. You don't know anything about the task. Uh, you have learned a little bit of the task, but you haven't done anything before in this task. So we get then this picture and I just show you what is meant here. So these are two lines with two actions, A1 and A2. And for both actions, you have a prior. This is just a single number, it's a magnitude. So it's a prior for action one, and this is a prior for action two. And they're non-informative, 50-50% uh, probability. So you don't know really what is the better um, thing. And, and here then you have the likelihood, which is really planning forward in that situation. And you might find that the likelihood of action A1 is higher than for action A2. And what you would then do is, as an agent, to multiply these two numbers to give you this number, and multiply these numbers to give you this number. And you can see that there is an advantage over A1, of A1 over A2, but not much. And the not much is because here it was clearer, but the prior really swamps the, um, the two magnitudes of the posterior. Now imagine that we we're exposed to this context a couple more times and A1 clearly is better, giving better reward maybe. And you repeat a couple of times the action. What we implemented then is to say, okay, every time you repeat an action, whatever the outcome, you don't look at the reward, just the repetition is important. Like Miller et al. 2019 did with their habits uh, without values, is that you just increase the prior. I've done this action, I increase my prior without looking at the outcome. Even if it's totally negative outcome, you would still increase it prior. And that would be this situation. So we still have exactly the same state situation. We get exactly the same likelihood, like here, but now the prior change. So the prior increase for A1 because it's better. We have done it more often than A2. And then there's a clear advantage of A1 over A2 in the posterior. And now imagine you do this a hundred times like in habit learning, like the animals do it hundreds of times. Then it would look like this, exactly the same situation as before. Now you have the likelihood the same again, but the prior is now really dominating for A1. And that means the posterior is dominating A2. And this is our idea that this trajectory describes how people really imagine habit learning. It's context specific and also explains why it's more resource efficient because if I were the brain and if I, this is what I've stored. And if I go into this context and see these priors, I would say, okay, for that prior year and the difference to this, okay, let's do a little bit of planning just to see whether we're on the safe side, a little bit, not much. Uh, and if you don't see any evidence in say a hundred milliseconds, let's, forget about planning. Let's go with the prior and then compute the posterior with what we have as a likelihood. But if you're still in this flat prior regime, then you really want to make the likelihood exact because that's the only source of information. 
and that describes this trajectory how you keep saving time because you can plan less and less in such a situation where you have such a dominating prior so that's our idea of how habits are learned so that was a simple thing <laughs> and now these are just really iconic equations Zara did them all I'm not pretending here that I derived them but the idea here what we did in the model is shown up here this is a hierarchical generative model and we have two time scales one is the context level and you have a sequence of contexts k minus one k k plus one so we imagine that the agent goes through a sequence of context like we do in our daily life we go from one situation to the next and then in each situation in each context sorry we have um, Markov decision process or partially observable Markov decision process and this context determines the policies and we have a prior over policies these are the prior of actions which I just showed you and also the agent learns um, what are the reward probabilities when do I got a reward in what state in that context and then the agent goes through this environment uh, doing stuff in each context and learns in each context um, how to be goal-directed and learns priors and becomes more and more habitual and the important thing for us is that the sequence of context means that the agent is assuming that it keeps switching from one context to the other and what humans and organisms need is to really uh, switch rapidly between contexts to not uh, go from one context to the next and say oh I don't know what to do in this context I need a lot of time to unlearn but we wanted to design an agent that is really quick in switching and this um, does the trick so to show this we did a lot of simulations and they're really just a few lines and just going through them in a quick pace but the idea really was to show in the simulations that we can um, emulate some of the main results of habit, habit learning experiments in rodents and the idea is always the same in these experiments that you have a mouse for example and there's one action lever press that gives the mouse a reinforcer a reward and then this is done hundreds of times and then there's an experimental manipula manipulation can be either outcome devaluation or contingency degradation either you satiate the animal or make the outcome aversive um, so the um, the outcome the reward has changed really and or you say okay now uh, pressing lever one doesn't give you a reward anymore anymore more like don't press the lever or in our little simulations we said okay press lever two or choose another action that's the experimental manipulation so we change um, the conditions of the experiment and then you go to an extinction test where level one no longer gives reward and then what people measure really is the number of times the number of trials the mouse or the rodent keeps pressing lever one and the longer it keeps pressing the stronger the habit that's that's roughly what people do and what we did is to take this I mean there are lots of variations of these experiments of course with all the glorious details and what we did is just to simplify the whole thing to a uh, um, two-armed uh, bandit task and said okay there's an agent that has two actions um, uh, available and then there is 200 trials uh, with two contexts uh, each 100 trial length along and the first one we call training so the animal or the agent here learns that when it presses in context one action one it gets reward 90 percent of the time if it press, press lever two 10 percent of the time and after trial number 100 this changes and now lever two gives 90% of the reward level one gives 10% of reward so that's what these lines here mean and what we want to do is to give an agent into that environment and then see what happens with the learning in this training period and what happens at switching the context so this is just the first simulations to show that it works basically what you see here is the so-called posterior of our context so the agent makes inference about what context am I in and the agent learns these contexts so it first is exposed to the first context and these um, pink dots mean context one was inferred and then you see there's a switch at trial 100 but it takes the agent a couple of trials to really switch 
to, to infer this is no longer the context uh, I was in before. I should really switch contexts and learn the contingencies in my new context. And that's happening here. Then you can also look at other things like, for example, at the so-called, what I showed you, the Q posterior over actions. And you can see here that during the training period, the um, agent learns to do action one. And then there's a switching period, which actually takes longer than the posterior context. And this H will then later be our measure of uh, how uh, strong the habit was in the agent. So longer, the more, uh, the stronger the habit. And then you can see that the agent uh, prefers to choose action two in most of the um, second context. And then you can also look at the actually chosen actions. So these are either here or here. So there's either action one, or action two. I can see that the learner it learns quickly to only press um, level A1. Sometimes it gets it wrong. And then after switching context and the posterior actions, it switches to um, choosing action two reliably. So this um, um, figure just shows that the simulation work as expected. So we have a little uh, learner <clears throat> that can switch between contexts, uh, learn context and switch between contexts. And then we can do all kinds of simulations um, emulating what people have done in experiments. And for example, we looked at the so-called habitual tendency, which we made a free parameter in our model. So an individual agent can have different habitual tendencies. And then you can do things like that. That, for example, you can have weak habit learners. So where the habit, this prior, which I showed you before with this bar, doesn't have such an effect as in a strong habit learner where they take the prior really seriously. Um, and then you can see that this is now the trial after switch. Um, this capital H I showed you in the figure before is shown here. So you can see that the contexts are really switched quickly and it doesn't depend much on the habitual tendency, but the actions, they actually choose, they do. So it takes agents with stronger habitual tendency longer to really switch the actions. Um, if they are weak habit learners, it takes only eight uh, trials. If they are um, strong habit learners, it takes 10 or more trials. So then you can do so-called ABA designs, <clears throat> which are really important for us because and that's, these experiments have been done before. So the idea here is that if you're an agent, <clears throat> excuse me, agent that um, is in context one as before, then context two, and then um, switches back to context one. So the new task after context two is do context one again. And then the question is what happens because the agent was exposed already to context one what we wanted to see is, like in animal experiments actually, is that the switching from context two back to context one is really fast because they infer immediately that this must be another context, maybe context one, and they switch to this context. And this is where the hierarchical model really excels that the context <coughs> state makes the switching very fast. And this is exactly what we see. <clears throat> So naive agent, which hasn't learned context one before, needs a lot of time trials to switch context and even more for switching the action. But an experienced agent, which has done context one, two, and then one again, is really super fast in uh, switching back to um, context one. So what we describe here as a model <clears throat> is a solution to explain how animals can be so fast in ABA designs to switch back to the context they have seen and experienced before. They really like inferring that context and reloading uh, into memory what they have learned in that context and completely forgetting about context two. So I don't want to show you more lines of things uh, where I claim this is like this, but basically the summary of what is really that <clears throat> this model accounts for all the habit learning characteristics that we know. Um, this is another um, simulation here where we just show that the duration of the training, this is log scale, going from one trial to 10,000 trials. Um, the training duration has of course an impact on how strong your habit is. And we've shown here that the strong habit learner, 
that it reaches a strong habit strength much faster than weak habit learners. Um, replicating another finding. What we have shown is <clears throat> that the way we implement habit learning, they be, uh, agents become insensitive, as shown here, to, um, to changes in the environment. Uh, it depends very much on training duration, how strong the habit is. Um, most importantly, we have shown how you can solve the problem um, to make habits really fast without going through the planning component. And importantly, context sensitivity is really key to our model. Without this, this wouldn't work because you wouldn't know which priors to load into memory. Okay, and this is um, one final result from our paper from 2021. It's just simulations. It didn't, we didn't fit any data. It was just trying to make a point. So this is just one slide. It's about the two-stage task. And I do apologize. I won't explain <laughs> what the two-stage task is. It would take just too much time. So this is just for the people among you who already know what the two-stage task is. Um, and later in questions, we can maybe go back to this and explain a bit more. But basically, what we did is to um, implement two agents going through the two-stage task. And one is purely goal-directed. So this is really mostly equivalent to what we would describe as model-based in um, the um, model free model versus model based reinforcement learning controllers. And what you replicate, there's no surprise because it's really doing model based planning, is the typical frequencies of state probabilities um, uh, in the four um, conditions. And then we switched on habit learning. And what we found is this pattern, which looks very much like the pattern you typically find in the mean in human participants. And this has been described before as model free and model-based um, controller mixing. And what we have shown here is that this result can also at least, in this average, um, very um, high-level result, you can achieve this just by saying, okay, there's a planner, but you make it dependent on the history of what actions you have chosen before. If you repeated actions, you're more habit-like, and that also gives you a result. So you don't need two controllers, but can just stay with one, actually. So that's just as a very brief summary of that slide is in the paper and it's also well described in the paper. So just a summary of that uh, paper in 2021. So our key question was really, okay, how to act fast and flexibly? And that was translated to the question, how can you do habits or things looking like habits without uh, having slow computations because of the model-based planning? And the framework or like we formulated in active inference really shows how we can balance habits and goal-directed actions in a single uh, framework. And then what's really key is the context-specific priors as an explanation for how habits are formed and what they really are and how they're controlling um, the mixing between habits and uh, goal-directed actions. And we found that in this one model, we explained all the habit learning characteristics, which I haven't seen in any other model. And then we, I only demonstrated here some lines, but not, not answer, I mean, uh, su not surprisingly, we found also the positive consequences of habits, which are that you're performing better and you're more robust in your actions uh, if the context doesn't change unexpectedly. So that's quite clear. If you're a strong habit learner, you're really good in staying in one context because you're more certain of what you're doing. Uh, but if context switches you will take longer than other people to or other agents to switch to another context but if you keep your environment stable or predictable in some sense um, habit learning is really of advantage okay i said in the abstract i will present another study which comes now which is not a modeling study it's an experimental study fmri study uh, but it's using the underlying same idea and we wanted to get more evidence for our train of thoughts so this is a paper by uh, Florian Ott, um, Eric Legner, and myself. And Florian is really the one who did um, nearly, mo nearly everything, so most of the work. And just to remind you what we mean by context is this idea that we learn, that we infer, that we maybe learn a lot of context in our environment. And then we come, when you come to the situation, we infer which context is currently active, and then we can retrieve all possible variables that we have learned in the past. 
And what we are mostly interested in here is the idea that um, you maybe can also store how much planning have you used in a specific task before. For example, if you're a participant of some psychological study um, and you repeat that study without telling your experimenter, you say you're a naive subject, you have an advantage clearly, you have done the task before. And maybe you have learned before how much effort, how much cognitive control, how much planning you had to invest into this task. And the idea here is that we humans, we learn so-called control context. That means we learn how much planning should go into a task. And, and by that we adapt our um, balance between, um, between um, the, should we invest and go goal-directed or should we just uh, respond more automatically and go more into the direction of habits. And that was really the goal of the experiment. And unfortunately the experiment is a bit complicated, but <laughs> I try to get through on this one slide here. I'm, I have no, um, I hope that I um, make it understandable, but uh, my apologies already now if I don't succeed here. But the idea is that we have one long experiment of 240 trials. Um, and there, there is a continuous story going for the subject. So they have to collect points over 240 trials. And they're shown the number of points they currently have in each trial, which is this yellow bar up here. So ideally that bar would fill over the 240 trial experiment because uh, the subject are told that they get money in proportion to the number of points they have collected during the 240 trials. And the task they have to do is the following. They get an offer uh, in the middle of the screen. Uh, it can only be one or four. Uh, one offer, two offer, three offer, four offer, shown here as currently a four offer. And then they have only one of two choices. They can either accept the offer or reject the offer. If they accept the offer, the following happens. It goes up here. Um, this here is actually a price they have to pay, the symbol here, a price to pay for this offer. So they buy four points with one energy. And the energy bar is down here. Uh, you can have between zero and six energy. When you have uh, six energy, if you get more energy, uh, you can't store it. So you have to operate with between zero and six energy. So you pay one and get the offer, and this is shown here. You added four points here, but you lose one energy. So you pay your, your price. And then next trial. And if you reject, um, you don't get the points obviously, but you get one energy. So you gain energy. So that's your way of keeping the energy somewhere in the middle here. Um, and then comes the next trial. So the difficulty for the subjects really is that if they are given an offer, they are well advised here to buy the four points because that's the highest possible. But for example, if they get one or two offers, should they invest their energy? Maybe the next three trials, there are only four offers. And if they then spend their energy for only um, silly points, they would not win the most points. And to really ensure that subjects, and that was our goal here, are forward planning in this task. So one element of forward planning was of course the energy bar, which makes you plan forward. And um, participants report this is quite enjoyable uh, task actually. And the other thing was that we introduced segments, which was just a way of saying that we lumped four trials together in a single segment. And subjects were always shown the current segment and the future segment. This is the second symbol here. And the segments, they are just two possible types. One is a low energy segment and the other was high energy, high cost segment. So that means that if you're here in this trial and see what the participant sees, you know that you have now, here's a one of four, you're in the first trial of this segment where you have only to pay one energy. But after the fourth trial, you will come to a next segment which will have high energy cost. And when you get on this trial here, this symbol goes there and a new symbol pops up which is the future segment here. So I hope you get the idea. So that makes things more complicated because for example, if you were a participant, you would have your one energy symbol and knew it would become more expensive. You would probably have the strategy of saying, okay, 
I burn out all my energy here in this low cost segment. And then in the future segment, I reject all the offers and keep collecting energy. And maybe because everything is very expensive here, not worth it. And I wait for the next segment after that. Maybe that's low cost again, and then I have saved my energy. Uh, here, I would only maybe accept offer four offers and the other one would uh, reject. So that's the idea of the experiment. Um, and I hope it became clear. Um, but the basic assumption of us was that participants would heavily plan forward to um, invest the energy points in valuable offers and not in other ones. So someone who only accepted would run dry of energy after six trials and would not get a juicy four offer after that, for example. So the assumption or the hypothesis here was that given that such a task and given one, two, three, four offers, one and four are actually quite easy to decide. One offer is usually not worth the energy. Four offers is usually worth the energy. So we assumed that there's a low control context or low cognitive control context saying that if you have an offer of four or one, uh, maybe you don't need to plan forward a lot um, because you have rejected offer one a lot in the past. You have accepted offer four a lot in the past. Why not just repeat the action like in um, the paper I presented you before? And this is different in the three and two offers where you have a high control context, which means that you're well advised to plan forward with these offers because they're more difficult. They're not easy to decide. And our idea was that the brain would of the participants would, when they see this offer, already switch to one of these control contexts and do things differently depending on the offer type. So to model this, we came up with a backward inference model, which is just um, solving the Markov decision process to, to get the best actions. Um, we implement this backward inference. And then we had a simple model, which is more like habitual, which just doesn't look into the future just uh, the, based on the offer it chooses. And then, of course, we had a hybrid model which mixes um, these two models. And the idea was the hybrid model mostly was we use a simple model for offer one and four, because why planning at all? Just reject the one, accept the four. Um, or in two and three, they, uh, participants use more the planning uh, model. So that was the idea. Yeah, and all the data and the code is available, made uh, Florian available at these two repositories. So this is now the data we found, and this is really just high level averages. But um, just to look at this here first. So the white bars, they are participants' behavior. There are 40 participants. And when we look at the behavior, you see that offer one was nearly always rejected. Offer four was nearly always accepted. Some subjects accepted offer one sometimes, some subjects rejected offer four. There are reasons for this. And offer two and three, uh, they're far away from 0% and 100%. So these are really the offers where you need to plan forward. And these other bars, I won't go into them. This is just what the three models uh, would do, uh, given exactly this, um, the trials the subject saw. Uh, when you go for model comparison directly, um, you find that the hybrid model is the best one. Exactly the model I talked about, which um, uses a simple model for offer one and four, uh, or uses a simple model more for offer one and four, and uses more the uh, planning model for offer two and three. And that was a winning year. That's the first uh, indication or evidence that participants did exactly like we thought, that they would treat offer one, two, three, four differently depending on what they learned in the task. We also looked at performance. So we found uh, because we used um, a model, we could um, estimate the amount of planning an individual participant did during the, all the task. And we could therefore correlate with the final points of that individual. And we found a clear correlation between planning and points, meaning the more you plan in this task, the more points you get. We found this for offer two and three, and also for offer one and four, but less planning in general. Okay, I'm nearly at the end. 
So this is another um, example of response time analysis where we found that um, what subjects don't do is to compute the conflict as assumed by some theories and frameworks and then say how much planning they will um, um, spend. But what we did is to really, but what we found is that of a two and three um, people use more planning because they have higher reaction times than offer um, one and four. So that's another evidence that subjects actually, even though there's the same conflict level, they use different amounts of planning. And that's really fMRI where we found the same thing. So very briefly, this is what everyone finds as a correlation of conflict with activity in dorsal anterior single cortex, also in anterior insula. And this is what we were looking for. We found that there's a higher correlation of conflict with the office two and three intermediate trials uh, compared to the correlation of conflict with office one and four. So the brain seems to use by default less planning, even there's the same conflict for um, the easy, the one and four office. Okay, just a summary for this paper. Uh, what we found is that participants seem to control the context, how much planning they invest, depending on offer. We found converging evidence for modeling response times and fMRI data. And the future question is, of course, how do humans learn these control contexts? Are there other ways of learning just the offer types? Conclusions. Uh, we found that context inference and priors of in action in the Schrubel paper explain how action selection can be fast and flexible. The key is really to use context and especially context inference. And the future questions are how do humans learn their context? And how can we, how can the human brain infer context rapidly so that you can quickly um, infer actions? Thank you very much.